Hi, welcome to this tutorial on how to determine whether a planet is east or west of the sun. Something that I expect for many of you will be a new and hopefully exciting pattern to, to use and to notice in your, your chart reading. Many of you will be familiar or will have read that the ascendant and descendant line which is the horizon, divides the chart into hemispheres, north and south. This lower hemisphere is the north. And of course, it's supposed to show our internal environment, whereas the southern hemisphere, the upper hemisphere, shows what's more external to us. And then the MCIC axis also divides the chart into hemispheres of the east and west, being self-driven or driven by others. But there are more ways to divide the chart into hemispheres that we might not be as familiar with. And looking at the chart this way will empower you to make concrete evaluations and assessments on a huge number of topics. So here's what this knowledge of east versus west relative to the sun can get you. You'll be able to uh, make real, accurate, useful assessments on, on things like the natives eminence and rank in society on their career right now a lot of the tools of that that modern astrology offers us don't really help us in knowing what social rank a person will have in their life in fact modern astrology doesn't really like to admit that there's such a thing as social rank at all it's a politically incorrect topic yet um uh, the more serious kinds of horoscopic analysis have ample methods for determining what role, what social function a native will play, and considerations of east versus west of the sun are vital to that. Likewise, similarly, the modern methods do not really give us too much in the way of understanding what it is that a person will do in the world, whereas the archaic methods help us to understand exactly that and in addition they divide the whole concept of career into um, different senses for example in the ancient textbooks there's the concept of magisterium that's a native's masteries the magisterium your masteries are what you're going to do whether you're paid for it or not it's your skills but then there was this concept of officium this is what you get paid to do, your offices, your duties. And then there was this marvelous concept called the regnum. A native's regnum is the kingdom. So will a native achieve a regnum? Will a native have a kingdom or not? These questions can be answered with the knowledge of east versus west of the sun by dividing the chart into hemispheres of, of east or west relative to the to the sun, the luminary, the seat of the ego. Marriage, sexuality, relationships, these topics can be very, very accurately judged and refined with the knowledge of east versus west of the sun. Timing and age considerations, timing factors in horary charts and in birth charts, understanding when things are going to happen later in life, earlier in life, and what kind of people are going to be, to be involved with the native age-wise? Will the wife or the husband be older or younger? Those types of considerations emerge when you examine the chart based upon east or west of the sun. Gender dynamics. Uh, you'll see throughout this tutorial that the concept of gender is managed and dealt with very adroitly by the chart. There are multiple levels of, of gender action that all synthesize. <clears throat> and I'll show you more what I mean later. So this is just really the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with the knowledge of east versus west of the sun. Now, we do have a problem with nomenclature that we have to get through, a problem with terms, because when you hear the word east, you might very properly think of ascendant and you should continue thinking of the ascendant when you hear the term east the two are synonymous similarly 
When you hear the term West, you should think of the descendant. But in this system, when I say East, I mean with respect to the sun. The sun is the, the focal point. So, in order to avoid confusion, I'm actually going to prefer the term Oriental instead of East and Occidental instead of West. Now, I do note that the term Oriental is appropriate to use in this context, but it's largely considered inappropriate to use with respect or with reference to Asian people, culture, and languages. But as an adjective used to orient a planet relative to the sun, oriental is quite appropriate to use, as is its complement, occidental. And this will avoid confusion um, with, with the hemisphere that is established by the ascendant and the descendant. As you'll see later in this tutorial, one of the refinements that we are going to introduce to this system is the notion of being east in the world. So a planet or a point can be oriental of the sun and oriental of the world, in the world. So in other words, <clears throat> the ascendant, the east, is east in the world all the time. But if the sun is loca uh, located or situated a certain way, then the ascendant might actually be, be west of the sun. So I'm going to clarify that uh, later. Another problem with nomenclature that we might have is that most of the terms are kind of inherently heteronormative. So that's a legitimate criticism that we ought to address, especially seeing that we're going to consider gender issues. Now, one of the, one of the more important realizations we can come, come to right off the bat is that gender considerations are not automatically synonymous with uh, sexuality. They're separate, or at least they can be separate. But these techniques they evolved in a time when heteronorms were the norm. <clears throat> and so we have to calibrate it. We have to calibrate it quite a bit. In the Middle Ages, if the astrologer is presented with the chart of a person who uh, obviously has a, a gender expression that is kind of different from that of his peers, then that astrologer would be expecting the worst for that native, simply because in the Middle Ages, those types of people were persecuted and oppressed and <clears throat> suffered all kinds of indignities at the hands of, of, their, of their fellow citizens. <clears throat> but today, it's not so much of a problem. Today, we allow people to awaken to their sexuality and to their gender identities in modes that are comfortable and appropriate for them, or at least we're trying to evolve in that direction which is certainly laudable. But we have to modify uh, these, these observations and make them relevant to the modern era. So in order to discourage us to make automatic assumptions with respect to biological gender, I'm going to attempt to prefer the terms yin and yang to refer to the concepts of feminine and masculine. In the occult purview, Feminine and masculine are, are merely um, representatives for the concept of duality, which stands in opposition to the concept of God, which is unity. So, feminine and masculine are the dual manifestations of an innately androgynous God. And the sun, our ego, is the fulcrum upon which these dualistic emanations of the hermaphroditic deity are balanced. The sun manages, we might even say the sun distributes the gender economy of the chart along lines of yin and yang. So here's how you do it. <clears throat> Since the sun is the reference point for this system, we establish the hemispheres of the chart based upon the sun. So shoot out a diameter, right? We want to notice the sun's opposition point, Right now, the sun is at 24 degrees Gemini. Therefore, its opposition point will be 24 degrees Sagittarius. It depends on where the sun is. So, the sun could be in Leo. In that case, the opposition point would be in Aquarius. And the solar hemispheres of the chart would be established that way. 
So this opposition is key to the entire system. Everything in earlier degrees than the sun up to this opposition point will be oriental, eastern, yang, masculine. Everything in later degrees than the sun up to the opposition point will be in the occidental hemisphere, the western hemisphere, yin, feminine. Now we have established the chart <clears throat> on a fundamental level of extroversion versus introversion, masculinity versus femininity, youth versus age, sooner versus later. We've established, uh, we have, we've established the chart on that basis. And this basis is, is fairly serious. It's fairly intense. Because these dispositions of the planets, being Eastern or Western, this is going to last several months. It all depends on the planet's opposition or conjunction with the sun. So it's going to be a while before the sun opposes Saturn. That's going, I'm, I'm sorry, Mars. That's going to happen later in the summer. And then Mars will change his phase. He will switch his orientation at that time from being an oriental planet to being an occidental one. And this will feminize the Mars. Way before that happens, when the sun goes through cancer, he'll oppose Saturn. Saturn will also at that time switch his orientation from eastern to western. Now, in order to really appreciate the effect this will have, you have to bear in mind that these planets have formal classifications <clears throat> that, that include their gender. And these formal classifications can be thought to contribute to the planet's essential nature. So Mars's nature is to be masculine. It's also his nature to be nocturnal because he's a nocturnal planet. It's also his nature to be evil because Evil is also a formal classification of a planet, as is good. The planets were uh, formally classified according to whether they were benefic or malefic. Mars is a malefic. That's his nature. So we're considering mainly the gender dynamics of the planets, and Mars's essential nature is masculine. <clears throat> so when he is Eastern and Oriental, then his masculinity is enhanced more yang energy is piled upon the Mars. When he is occidental and western, then there's more yin energy associated with that Mars. And it's going to be a more instinctive aggression, a more internal kind of aggression, less calculating, right? And more intuitive. So what I want you to understand is that <clears throat> when a planet is refined by being east or west of the sun, this edges it off of the baseline. It, it nudges the planet this way or that way off of its normal, natural condition and in introduces something foreign to that planet. We can see, for instance, <clears throat> that Jupiter is occidental and western. Jupiter is feminized. This is contrary to Jupiter's nature. Jupiter is a masculine yang planet. And so the extra yin energy conferred by being western is going to make this Jupiter express in a way that is not necessarily Jupiterian, which is to say is going to make the Jupiter internalized and introverted. Jupiter, by its nature, is not an introverted energy, but this one is because it's occidental. Now, we synthesize this with other modes of being yin or yang. So, for example, Jupiter is in a yin sign, Scorpio. This increases the yin energy. Now, this is a fairly serious and, and durable, kind of long-lasting influence. But we also have the Midheaven and Imam Chaley and also the Ascendant and Descendant, right? We have these axes as well. The MC-IC 
and the ascendant descendant establish the chart into quadrants that themselves are oriental or occidental yin or yang i've put a red circle in those quadrants that are oriental and masculine and yang and i've put a blue dot in those quadrants that are occidental and western and yin and this helps us to refine our understanding of the gender concept even further so we can see that the mars is not only in a yang sign and is not only oriental of the sun and thus more yang but it's in a yang quadrant so what it represents is going to happen early in the life of the native if this is a birth chart or it's going to happen rather early in the process of the question if this is a horary chart it's going to happen in youth and the mars is going to be excessively yang excessively conscious and 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 planning very outgoing with its aggress aggression right the yang qualities might be abundant and excessive and this is a problem now not to confuse you or blow your mind up with too much information here but we can introduce the, the sect concept to great effect for an extraordinary level of of nuance and nuancing and sharpening our understanding so in other words we can notice that this is a night chart the sun is beneath the horizon and mars is above the horizon in this night chart <clears throat> and that gives us greater confidence that the mars will have a socially approved of expression because it's at night and this is a nocturnal planet so we can say instead now based upon the second consideration that this is a mars of victory and leadership venus she's in a yang sign in a yang quadrant but she's occidental of the sun so this would be a venus that would definitely need freedom and the ability to go for what she wanted when she wanted to go for it but these needs for freedom would not be too great not not so great that they would prevent her from having a relationship because of venus's occidentality and westernness we'd be able to confidently tell the person who, who whose chart this is that uh, the the one of the main themes in the marriage is going to be freedom and a need for freedom so this venus would be describing the spouse and the marriage itself because she's occidental then that marriage might happen a little bit later in life now what i want to impress upon you is that the quadrants established by the midheaven and the ascendant <clears throat> the planets are throughout a 24-hour period are going to go through all of these quadrants so this is a level of interpretation that is more accidental depending on what time of day something is born whereas the oriental or occidental condition is more long term because the planet has to wait until its opposition or conjunction with the sun before it changes its phase and switches its orientation in terms of differentiating between these two states we would use the phrase east or west in the world <clears throat> so mars is east of the sun and he's east in the world because he's in an eastern quadrant jupiter is west of the sun because he's occidental according to the sun's division of the chart into east west hemispheres jupiter is west but he's east in the world because of his quadrant position right saturn is east of the sun but he's west in the world so you get the idea now one reason that these planets that are oriental are associated with the east <clears throat> is because they rise in the morning before the sun does and these occidental western planets are associated with the west in the seventh house because they set after the sun sets let me show you okay so here's the sun and as you'll see when I step this chart forward in hourly increments the planets that are occidental to the Sun are going to trail behind him and set so let's go forward a few hours you see mercury and moon and Venus <clears throat> it's easier to see that they are occidental and thus setting or as we might say pertaining to setting it's easy to see that Jupiter is a little bit of a harder case and even Saturn is harder to assess because when planets are a little closer to this opposition point it gets a little fuzzier and more difficult to to tell whether they're eastern or western but see the sun 
an hour later, slips beneath the horizon. It's now nighttime. Sunset has occurred. Jupiter is still up. So he's occidental. That's how we can know he is occidental. He's still above the horizon. Saturn has yet to rise. This is how we can know he is oriental. This is how we can know that he is rising before the sun because the sun has already set. Uh, again, this would be easier to see if Saturn were distanced from the opposition point like Mars is or Neptune or, or better Uranus. It's easier to see that these planets are rising before the sun. See, let me go ahead and show you. So an hour later, Saturn is arising. Now, <clears throat> Okay, this, at, at this time, this is approximately 9.43 at night. Okay, so let's say a native was born sometime that day. And it was like a thousand years ago. Okay, let's go back in time like 800 years. And somebody's born in that afternoon. We, the astrologers, might go outside in the evening to see what planet is rising. Because this will have something to say about the eminence, the social rank of that native and his or her career. Because these planets were thought to be arising, coming into being, being born at that time. But their visibility, their rising before the sun, makes them behave something like heralds. They are heralding something for the native. In this case, Saturn rising, it's heralding a spirit of sobriety and responsibility and rank <clears throat> and, 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 and achievement and even things like fear or, or sadness and other meanings of Saturn. Of course, they wouldn't have been able to see Pluto. Then they would notice that a couple of hours later, Mars rises. You'd be able to see Mars rising in the east, and this would herald a martial type of energy event or person for that native, and in youth, because the east is associated with youth. right? And we can see on the western side of the sun how all the planets are setting after him. There goes Jupiter, finally setting. Now notice how Jupiter has set and the sun has not risen yet. That's another way we can know that Jupiter pertains to setting and is an occidental planet. Now of course Saturn soon will change his phase in a couple of days as the sun ingresses into Cancer. And then he comes to the opposition point of Saturn. So we want to go forward another day. Maybe even another day just to be just to be careful. No, let's go back to, to the day before the 27th of June and just bump it forth a couple of hours. Okay, yeah. Now, the sun has just crossed beyond the opposition point with Saturn. Saturn has just changed his phase. Natives born now will have a very different kind of Saturn. The Saturn who is Western has a little bit less authority to produce the good outcomes of Saturn, which are organization and giving birth to forms and, and being disciplined. And there, there might be more of an inclination to the more negative manifestations of Saturn, sadness, fear, things like that. All right, all because Saturn is occidental. Because Westernness is foreign to Saturn's nature, then he has less authority to bring about the the better outcomes for Saturn. And the same can be said for the other superior planets, Jupiter and Mars. The inferior planets, Mercury and Venus, they function better and optimally when they are occidental of the Sun. And this is all a way of saying that the, the effects of the planets are <clears throat> more lasting and have better outcomes for the, for the individual when they are in a hemisphere relative to the Sun that is appropriate for them. And when they are not so appropriately placed, then they have that much less authority and capacity to produce a good outcome. So Jupiter, being occidental, Jupiter at all times has the nature of wanting to bring forth wisdom, abundance, freedom, easiness in all things, and on and on. But when he's occidental, then his ability to do that is undermined just a bit. It's like a sliding scale. There might be other factors which, which help the Jupiter out, which help the Jupiter um, access its nature more easily, such as, for example, maybe this trine with the sun. That could be helpful for Jupiter. You know, so again, it's a sliding scale. The square from Mars certainly hurts Jupiter some more, and on and on.
It's a synthesis of various factors. Let's see what happens when Venus changes phase. Right, that's going to happen when she gets down here. Mercury, if, let's, let's look at Mercury. He just changed his phase too. He, he went retrograde. And obviously the retrogradation cycle is, is, a, is vital to this process. See, now Mercury has just changed his phase and switched from being occidental to oriental. Right, give it a couple of days, let Mercury get distanced from the sun enough. You know, and now we have a situation where Mercury is making an appearance in the morning. See, Mercury has just risen before the sun has come up, so it's dark. In the pre-dawn hours, Mercury would be visible. This is a rare phenomenon due to Mercury's cycle with the sun. He's usually too close to the sun to be visible, but now Mercury is making an appearance. And this would say something again about the social rank of the individual, about her or his profession and what their skills would be. It says something about their magisterium, their masteries, their officium, their offices, and their regnum, their kingdom. It's very, very important. Mercury is making an appearance and heralding something mercurial. But let's, our, let's return our attention to Venus. She's in the Yang sign, Libra, which she rules. Let's go forward a month or so. Now she's in Scorpio, a Yin sign, a sign where she has her detriment. But she's going to turn retrograde soon and prepare to change phase with the sun. So I, I, did, I, I advanced it a couple, like by months, a couple of months later, and this is late autumn of 2018, Venus is retrograding back to the sun. And she's going to cross over him. Now she's changed her phase and she's an oriental planet. We have a different Venus on our hands. Now, the, the independence needs of this Venus are going to be pitched more intense, <clears throat> whether male or female. Right? The proximity of Venus to the sun means she's absorbed. And this is a process that I think is very important in the gender dynamics of these relationships. The absorption by the sun has some something important to do with with this change of phase. So now Venus is oriental. She's more active and extroverted. But look what happens when she retrogrades into the terminal degrees of Libra. Now she's in a Yang sign, more extroverted still, and this might be a problem. What if we have a situation with such a Venus where she's in the seventh? Is this good for marriage or not? Now, this is a tricky question because, you know, Venus has great analogy with marriage. And we, we think, look, okay, Venus in the seventh house, this person is definitely going to get married and it's definitely going to be good. And we might be kind of right. But I'll tell you something, Venus in the seventh, I've noticed, is definitely not a slam dunk for a fairy tale romantic situation, not by a long chalk. And especially in the chart of a male, this kind of Venus Venus in the seventh in the chart of a male, any kind of Venus, is going to say that his wife or spouse or chief partner is going to be kind of adversarial with him. She's going to oppose him because she's in the house of opposition, the seventh. When, when assessing the seventh, one has to determine whether this is a house of partnership or opposition. So, with this oriental Venus... In a yang sign, the yang qualities are such that we surely would prognosticate marriage in the birth chart of a, of a native, but also divorce at the same time. We, if this were the chart of a male, we might speculate that that he would be a milk toast. This his his spouse would run him. Let me put it plainly: his wife would run that man sexually, um, domestically, publicly, privately. She would definitely be the boss. So let's look at an example chart. This is the chart of Harry, Prince of Wales. And what we want to do, our first item of business with this level of chart reading, is to establish that all-important diameter line between the sun and his opposition point. We would have to do this mentally. Now, the sun is at 22 Pisces, so 22 and some, almost 23 actually, so we'll put the opposition point at I'm sorry, the sun is at 22 Virgo, almost 23 degrees Virgo, so we would put the opposition point at 23 Pisces. And this establishes the chart into hemispheres of east and west. <clears throat> now, can you guys tell which is east and which is west? Recall what I said. This is very important. If you, The degrees that are earlier, 
All right, the degrees that are earlier all the way up to the opposition point are oriental. So Mercury and the moon are oriental. I should say this about the moon. The moon does not really fit into all of these categories. In fact, she, we kind of leave her out of consideration in this scheme. Why? Because the moon has her own east-west dichotomy. Oops. The moon has her own east-west dichotomy that speaks uh, to other things. <clears throat> right? That speak to other things, but that might be the topic for another uh, video one day. So what we notice is that Venus, Saturn, Mars, Jupiter are all occidental planets. Right? They, come, they fall in degrees later than the suns up to the opposition point. They're occidental. So for Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter, this is a problem. Quote, unquote, problem. For Prince Harry, it's not. It merely means he's not going to be king, something we, something we already know one day. <clears throat> but then again, the charts of so-called kings aren't very kingly either. President Trump does not have a presidential chart, according to, to the eminence indicators that we've learned in this tutorial. But then again, neither did President Obama and neither did President Bush. Many, many times, very often, you'll find a leader whose chart says that he really shouldn't be leading anything. A lot of times you'll find the chart of a leader who doesn't even have the chart of a CEO, let alone a governor or a president. So we can tell from the occidentality of the superior planets that the prince is not going to have the regnum, the kingdom. But, you know, this doesn't mean he's going to be unhappy. These are practical considerations. Look at the Mars. In a yang sign, Mars is naturally a yang planet. And so we might say that the prince has the appropriate tempering. That's how a Nostradamus style astrologer might phrase it. There is a, some tempering and balancing going on here with this Mars. Very masculine Mars, yet due to being occidental, not dangerously masculine, not foolhardy, we might say. And indeed, the prince was in the military, but, you know, one has to question what kind of dangerous situation that he would have been put into. Like, I don't think they would have put him on the front lines of anything because he's royalty. That's the occidentality of Mars coming through. It's a very masculine Mars, yet we have to draw back on that yang quality a bit because it's occidental. And here we see his wife, Venus Libra, right? She's occidental too, and... The prince didn't get married until he was in his early 30s. Venus is in a yang sign, but the occidentality, the westernness of the Venus, makes the masculine qualities, or, or better said, makes the, the freedom needs not so much that they would potentially disrupt the relationship. And besides, Libra, despite being a masculine sign, is still very much concerned with smoothing over any kind of social intercourse. In fact, it might be too concerned with these things. So we can see that the, the Venus is fairly well situated. It's a pretty decent start to a, uh, to a good marriage. She's going to have independence needs, but they won't be so much that they would disrupt the marriage. Now, of course, other chart factors in their synastry would certainly <laughs> round out the picture. But uh, so far, we can we can see that the Venus gives us timing factors on when he would get married, and they say something about his wife. Here's the chart of John Lennon. We can tell from his seventh house um, a lot of uh, factors about his marriage, but again, we have to decide whether this is a seventh house of marriage or a seventh house of, of controversy. And indeed, it's the seventh house of the assassin. Now, Mercury is occidental of the sun and is feminized and is in an occidental yin quadrant and thus mercury scorpio is a better significator for yoko ono than is venus virgo mercury scorpio feminized thoroughly by being in a feminine sign being occidental and being in a western quadrant is the significator for yoko ono 
and describes Yoko Ono. Venus, ignored in, in, in Virgo, ruler of the seventh house of the assassin, <clears throat> is the planetary significator for the individual who assassinated John Lennon. Note that Venus is in a masculine quadrant. In the lower hemisphere of the chart, this green line is the ascended descendant line, the horizon. His moon, showing his appetite for social change, Aquarius, is in the masculine sign and a masculine quadrant. That tells us some, a, a lot about his behavior. So you get the picture. You get the idea of how it's done. I'll go ahead and wrap things up here because I don't want the tutorial to get so long that it's not useful. So this is essentially an introduction to the technique. Now, now it's time to evaluate it uh, using your own working charts to see uh, what sorts of insights it gives to you. Thank you for watching.